I have no idea what that British man with his leather jacket was all about there, but I know what he was talking about. <laughs> Thank you for, you do. I've heard of it. All right, good, good, good for you. <laughs> um, we're here to talk about voice, but before that, I just want to get a quick show of hand. How many people here have heard of AI Sense? Yes, you have, because you work for them, I get that. <laughs> all right, there's a few people. You have. How many of you have heard of Google? <laughs> Google, a little search company. A couple of people didn't raise their hands. I'm worried about you. You're, you're at the wrong conference. Sam, can you just briefly explain what AI Sense is all about? Um, we're a little bit smaller than Cassie's company. Um, we are a small startup in Silicon Valley. We build a new technology called ambient voice intelligence. Well, in plain world, um, we do something very different from Alexa or Google Assistant. How many people have been to the main stage and have seen the real-time transcription for all the keynotes and panels? Um, that's built by us. Um, so we have done something that Google has never done before. Uh, we raised an animal. It's called an otter. For people who don't know, otter is one of the smartest animals in the world. Otter is the app that um, TechCrunch is use, using to do the transcription for all the uh, keynotes and panels. So how many people have actually downloaded otter? Do you like it? <laughs> All right, uh, I have a few otters here. Let me see. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> That's All right, one more. Oh. Uh, all right, nice yeah. Throw. If you haven't downloaded download Otter right now, it's a free app. Uh, you're going to have all the uh, sessions, including this session, although it's not done in real time on the next stage. So uh, we build our own speech recognition technologies. Um, we focus on something different than Google. Uh, we're not, we don't want to compete against Cassie. Um, the thing we do is a human-to-human -human voice interface. So that's what people have been doing for thousands of years. They talk to each other. Absolutely. Um, now, Kathy, I know there's a Google Mini underneath everybody's seat. Just, you know, take a look. <laughs> um, <laughs> nobody did. Jeez, nobody's falling for this. <laughs> um, I just want, I want to roll this up from, from behind a little bit. Because um, we've, and you've worked on this, actually. We, we've had speech interfaces for a while. We've had they sucked. Like most of them were not very good. Um, if, if in the last 10 years or so, five years, they got a little bit better. In the last three, four years, they really got good. Mm -hmm. What has changed? Yeah, you know, just this morning I was thinking about um, when I first got started in this space, which is 1999, um, and I was looking for a new job, and I saw a job ad for a company called Nuance Communications, and they said they did speech recognition, and I said, that doesn't work. But they had a, a phone line you could call, and they had some demos, and you could transfer in this fake banking account, $500 from checking to savings, and I was like, this is so cool. And I went and um, worked there for a long time, learned a lot about conversational systems, but I got really disillusioned, and I decided I was gonna change careers, um, and uh, obviously it got sucked back in, and, and one of the main reasons for that was the advent of the smart speakers, um, because it's really a, a fundamentally different use case. Part of it is the technology. We've certainly gotten way better with speech recognition accuracy. Uh, the far field microphones obviously make it a lot more tenable, but um, it's also the use case because so often in the world of building IVRs or phone systems, it was to keep humans away from humans um, because that was the cost saving measure. And these new smart speakers are a whole different use case. They're adding things that I wouldn't be doing necessarily with a human. And I'm very excited about the possibility of these, these systems. 
I think a lot about uh, the potential for accessibility for people who perhaps visually impaired, maybe they don't have good fine motor control, seniors who might not have a smartphone, places uh, in the world where people, where the literacy rate is not as high, you might get a phone, but you can't really use it very well. And I think these voice systems present this new opportunity um, to allow people into a world that perhaps they didn't have access to before. And we're still in the infancy of this technology, um, but I see so much potential and I'm, I'm really excited about it. Absolutely. Uh, and I want to get back to accessibility a little bit later on. But first for Sam, you decided to build your own voice recognition system, even though there's, there's Googles out there, there's Amazons, there's Microsofts, there's all kinds of other systems. Why build your own? We actually uh, we started two years ago in 2016. Um, we tested a bunch of uh, uh, speech recognition APIs, including Google, Microsoft, IBM, Nuance. We found that um, their system actually are really good for voice search. When you do voice search, you ask a short question like, what's the weather tomorrow? How's the traffic to San Francisco? And the machine answered that question really well. However, when I try it for human-to-human -human conversations, when I use that interface to record a meeting and transcribe it, the quality is actually pretty low. Um, I guess, you know, for people who are doing speech recognition for a while, you know, there's a lot of differences when you do human-to-human -human conversations because, you know, there, first of all, it's a far field versus near field multiple speakers versus a single speaker, um, you know, short question versus long question. So we actually built a team that do our own training and uh, build a specific system that's optimized for uh, multiple people, long conversations. Is that fair, Kathy? Is it true for the Google system? I mean, there's certainly different use cases. Um, you know, at the moment, I'm not going to use my Google Assistant for, for transcribing meetings. But, um, but there are certainly um, more engaging and involved experiences that people do have with their assistant, um, whether they're doing a long transaction like shopping, whether they're playing a fun game, whether they're all sitting around as a family and playing a game or uh, listening to music. Um, there are a lot of different journeys that you might want to go on with your voice assistant, and I think Google, we're looking at all these different places where you might be, where you might want to use voice or typing to interact and make sure that we can uh, provide the thing for all these different ways in which you might want to use it. Hmm. There's, there's something else that has changed too, I think, and it's true for both of your use cases, I think, is that people actually are not that afraid of talking to machines anymore. I think if you'd asked five years ago or so, people were just nervous about the whole, oh, and it looks weird, and I don't want to be talking to a machine. That has really changed, too, but there's still hesitance, I think. What, what can you do to, to take that away, that, that impediment? I think part of it is being very transparent. Um, for example, with the Google Assistant, you can look on the app on your phone. It will show you any time that the Google Assistant woke up and uh, thought you were talking to it. You can delete those recordings. We, of course, anonymize those recordings, and we don't store them long term. So being transparent is one thing. Um, but I think also it's. it's a new technology, and it's interesting to me to see the difference between people who perhaps are a little suspicious about something like a smart speaker sitting in their kitchen counter, but they're happy to carry a phone around with them all day that has a microphone and is more easily you know, hackable. Um, so part of it's perception, but perception is more important than reality. So it's important to us to make sure that we address that and don't try to dismiss it, um, but really listen to what people are, are concerned about and make sure we work to, to really understand that and address that. And Sam, when we talked earlier um, last week, you, you were talking about how ideally maybe you want to record everything. <laughs> yeah, this is something very scary, and um, it made a lot, um, may make a lot of people uncomfortable. But um, eventually, I think this system could be always on. Um, you know, for myself, I would love to have something that I can use to. Um, it listened to what my mother told me when I was in high school. Um, you know, it's actually a lot of precious moments that uh, they're not scheduled. Um, you know, it just happens naturally, spontaneously. 
So uh, people, you know, of course, there's a privacy concern. We can touch on, uh, talk about that later. But if you think about it, your life is actually pretty short. You know, how long can you live? A hundred years. Um, but um, you know, what if you know all the people you meet, all the things you do, uh, extremely precious. Um, I hope you know we our system eventually can record all of them, transcribe all of them, make everything searchable. You know, I, when I'm coming to this drop, I'm probably already talking to 50 or 100 people already. You know, there's no way for me to remember everything I heard. So when I walk around now, I just turn on the order. So whoever talked to me, it's captured. So I remember what they said. And then and later I can. Is that legal? <laughs> is that legal? Can you just read? I, I forget this what is the a law public in event. Is. Actually, legally, you don't have to tell people because people don't expect privacy in this type of uh, uh, event. Um, and uh, the, the federal law is uh, one-party consent, uh, although California is two-party consent. All right. How many people here in the audience want everything recorded that they're doing? Uh, one guy? One guy? <laughs> two guys? Okay. Three people? Three out of a few hundred? That's um, your... Well, it, if you've got some... Um, we, there is some psychological resistance, but if you look at the history, in, look back in 30 years, 40 years, how many things are recorded 40 years ago compared to what we are doing today? Uh, think about what Google is doing, what Facebook is doing. Um, when you are walking on the street, you are being recorded by the video camera on the street right. anyway. All right. Kathy, you look rather skeptical. You guys just had that duplex thing happening <laughs> where, if, I don't know if you guys remember duplex, but it was uh, the Google Assistant making phone calls on your behalf and it was, everything was a little bit complicated about that legally and um, ethically. Yeah, I mean, I think personally for me, uh, although it's true, we're becoming a society of recording so many things, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right direction to go in. So it's this, it's this real catch-22 because if we had never collected data from people speaking, like you remember Google 411, things like that, to build these data models, there would be no Google Assistant or any of these things. But that being said, we can still be, um, you know, try to be ethically responsible with, with how we record the data, how we tell people we're recording their data, let them control that as much as we can. It's a complicated subject, um, but I think it's something we have to think about carefully as we continue on this, this road where everything is, more and more things are being recorded. All right. I didn't think we were going to go down this rat hole, but we did, and it's maybe for the better. Um, on the technical side, just to switch gears a little bit, have we, have we solved voice recognition? So it's, it's, it's important to break voice recognition down into two main things, which is the ASR, the automated speech recognition, which is the, the actual knowing the words that somebody said versus the natural language understanding or the intent. It's kind of like, you know, I don't speak German. Um, if you're speaking German to me, I could probably write down the sounds you were making and kind of uh, get that correct, but I would have no idea what you said. As far as the recognition accuracy goes, we are doing very well. It's actually, it's not perfect by any means, neither is human speech recognition, but it's good enough that we can do a lot of things. Things. Where we really are a long way from, from solving is more the intent side of things. Um, that's a huge problem. One of the biggest challenges in this space is what we call discoverability. With something like a voice assistant, it could do thousands of things, but how do you know what they are or what they aren't? Um, we need to move towards a world where we can ask it anything, even if it can't do everything. Um, kind of like if I go to a concierge in a hotel and I say, can you rent me a car? And they might say, uh, no. They're not going to say, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Or they might say, go across the street, there's a car rental place. And so we need our voice assistants to get to the place where I can ask anything and it can correctly direct me to something or just admit, you know, no, we, we don't know how to do that. And we're a long way from that and it's a very big challenge. Actually, a big part of that uh, challenge to, to uh, address that challenge is um, um, context awareness. So uh, when, you, when you're using a mobile device, um, you know, I used to work on uh, Google Map location service, so I know a lot uh, about location um, context. So uh, whether you are at the conference here, or you are at work, or at, uh, you are at home, the things you speak about is actually quite different. Uh, the phone actually knows the location. It can adjust the speech recognition system. 
It can adjust the language model. Um, and also, uh, there's a new technology uh, called uh, directization and speaker ID, which uh, we actually built into Otter to uh, recognize uh, who the speaker is. Mm -hmm. um, so once you, you know, understand who is talking, you can actually, the system can look up their LinkedIn page, can look up their Facebook page, understand the background of that person, then it can incorporate that knowledge into the speech recognition system to better understand what they're talking about. So the ideal would be a Google Glass that's recording everything <laughs> and gives you a LinkedIn profile. Is that <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, my view is that it's not about logging the data, it's about who can get access to the data. You have to control um, the, uh, the access. But logging the data, actually, is, there's a lot of benefits for the use, user. All right, fair enough, fair enough. One thing Google has done recently with the assistant program is the smart displays as well, which just adds another dimension to working with, with a digital assistant and working with voice. How's that working out so far? What's your experience been and how people have been using those? And there's only one on the market so far, but kind of what's, how's, how does, and how does that change voice interaction? Yeah, um, I think sometimes people think that when you design voice user interfaces that you're a voice only kind of, have a voice only philosophy, like everything has to be voice only and screens are going to disappear forever and, and we don't really think that way. Voice uh, is, a, is a great medium for a lot of cases, but a lot of times a visual medium is better and so some of these smart displays um, are, are great. If you want to browse for something, like you're shopping for a new shirt um, or you're picking a paint color, imagine if it's like, which color blue would you like? light blue, light, light blue. I mean, that would be a terrible voice only interface. Um, so visuals, of course, come in very handy there. And again, back to the sort of hands-free, one of the big use cases right now is in the kitchen. Uh, you're cooking, your hands are dirty, but you want to be following a recipe. You want to watch maybe a video of how somebody stirs something or chops something. And having that additional visual element is, is really handy. But I think it's, it's kind of a brave new world, and I can't wait to find out how people are going to build stuff for these new displays. I think there's going to be a lot of creativity and interesting things coming. I've tried that recipe thing. It's great. I, I've never, I don't have the ingredients, so it's, there's no point for me to use it. But so you just have to add shopping. Uh, shopping list as well, yeah, yeah true, <laughs> true. I can do that, I can do that. Um, what's the future of voice at this point? What, what does that look like? Um, for you, it's recording everything <laughs> and understanding everything, but what, what's next in voice? Well, to achieve that, that actually will take a long time to fully understand what people are talking about, uh, their intention. You know, one of the use cases is actually related to health. You know, um, if you can record everything, it listens to everything you say, uh, hears um, the other people's voice. You know, it can detect det uh, depression before you realize you're depressed. Okay. Um, it can understand your emotion understand, you know, when you feel, you know, upset, you know, it knows all the historical conversations you had, you know, who did you talk to in the last week? Um, you know, students, you, I mentioned accessibility, students are actually using Otter in uh, university um, lecture rooms to take lecture notes and, you know, people who have uh, hearing difficulties. So, um, what's next? You know, all of this, there, there, I was think there are thousands of use cases to, um, by leveraging this kind of technologies, you know, listen to everything, understand everything. I'd add to that, um, I think personalization is gonna play a big part. Right now, you know, we can do mildly personal things like during breakfast I can say, hey Google, is my flight on time? which is great because I don't have to have, you know, I've got like 15 air airline apps on my phone and I can't log into them half the time. I don't even have to say the name of the airline or anything. Um, but I can imagine a future maybe where you're kind of growing up with your own virtual assistant and it gets to know you because designing one assistant that is all things to all people is very, very challenging because we're all different. Even our, each one of us during the day is different. So maybe in the morning um, I'm grumpy and I don't want to hear your dad jokes. But in the evening I'm relaxed and I want to have a chat. And so I I think get, having these assistants know you a little better and be able to, to modify the things they might offer you or the way they might communicate with you um, could be uh, a potential thing happening. 
no dad jokes in the morning? No. Maybe about after about 10.30. All right, all right, 10.30, that sounds good. It is, uh, our time is up, so we can start doing the dad jokes now, and <laughs> we'll do that backstage. Thank you. Thank you. Great.